thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your protection and your love, dear Lord. We thank you for your grace, Lord. We thank you for all of the things that, that you have supplied us with to maintain us, dear Lord, through the ups and the downs, dear Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for your spirit. Yes. Enabling us, dear Lord, to please you for all faith. Yes, Lord. Lord. We thank you right now, dear Lord. Ooh, we are encouraged. We know there are some, yeah. some, some un, uncertain things happening on today, dear Lord. But the only thing is certain is that, that is, is you and what you say in your word, dear Lord. Thank and we are encouraged, dear Lord. We are, we are bothered you. by the events of Thank today. You. We also are encouraged because it is your word, dear Lord, unfolding before our very eyes. Dear Lord. Mm. And we thank you right now. We thank you, Lord, for for, for just overlooking our faults and seeing our yes, needs. God. We thank you, Lord, for seeing our need to once again come together and enjoy your word, dear Lord. We thank you, Lord, for Mother Motley. We thank you, Lord, for her teaching, dear Lord. We ask you to continue to encourage her, dear Lord. Continue, dear Lord, to encourage your heart, dear Lord, to share the knowledge yes. and the wisdom of your word, dear Lord, with us, dear Lord. That it will inspire us, dear Lord, to do the same with others, dear Lord. We ask you, dear Lord, to continue, dear Lord, to lead us and guide us through the in the in yes, these last and evil days, dear Lord. We ask you to bless the sick and afflicted, dear Lord. We ask you, dear Lord, to let our presence and our words, dear Lord, be oh, healing yeah. for the world, dear Lord. These and other blessings we ask in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Some of you have heard me teach from these four horses on Mother's Day, but this is not going to be anything like you've heard me teach. Um, on Mother's Day, because when you've heard me teach women beware the headless horseman, I was really teaching about the spirit of the headless horseman that is in the land today. I am so excited about <laughs> this chapter so far. I, I, I am, I am. It's like with all of what I am teaching in this book, it takes a long time to put this stuff together. You all know how long we've been coming together and we just begin in chapter six. So you've been here right along with me. I'm excited about John being able to walk through the door of the Holy of Holies to see things that were to come or are to come that we have yet to experience. It is so exciting for me to visualize John being in heaven. It is so exciting for me to visualize him having gone through that door to see something that nobody in the flesh had ever seen and been able to come back to the earth and write about. Now, the door was open, but he still couldn't walk through it. He had to receive the invitation to come through it. And we all have an invitation. And one day we will all walk through um that door when the rapture takes place we will all be on the other side of that door when i was a little girl i dreamed about that door and i dreamed that god himself opened that door for me i must have been six or seven and i didn't realize exactly what i was seeing but i told my mother the dream because she was still alive and she told me what it was that i had seen so as we began to go through today what I am going to do is walk you through the um, beginning of chapter six. We'll probably be in this chapter for many, many weeks because it's going to take us a while just to get through all four of the horses. Now, uh, James, third chapter, verses two and three say, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. Jeremiah 8 and 6 says, I listened and heard, but they don't speak aright. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? 
everyone turned to his own course as the horse rushes into battle. And this is an indication of impetuous sin. In Revelation 6 and 1, it says, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it was the voice of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, come and see. Now, you remember the four beasts. We talked about them, and we did an extensive study about them, and I put them back up again tonight. So we see the four beasts, the lion, we see the ox, we see the eagle, and we see the man. And it, he doesn't say which one said it. I would say it was the man because, of course, I would surmise that the others could not speak, but that doesn't mean that I am right because I wasn't there and I don't know. And, of course, John did not say. But he did say that he heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. Now, I'm going to, to take a little time with that because there's a lot of things here um, that I want to talk about, especially as a professor. I want to go through this thing and, and, and really dissect it for you all. Now, in chapter 5, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth was the only one worthy to take the book. Now, we know that the personification of the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth in New Testament scripture is Jesus Christ. And so he took the seals. He was the only one worthy. You remember those lessons. Tonight's lesson will be the beginning of us. When we stop, the seals had begun to be open. Now they are open. We're going to deal with the first of seven seals. And so that is why one of the four beasts around the throne said, come. Now in this King James scripture, I want you to look on your screen and take a look at the word come. Look at the comma before come. Typically, when you have a comma, unless it is a proper name like Shirley John Gale, you will not have a capital letter coming after a comma. Now, a lot of Bibles that I went through don't have the capital letter. I personally prefer King James, and it has the capital C. And I said, now, Lord, why does this C need to be capitalized. I wondered about why it was capitalized coming after a comma, because if anybody in here teach English, or if anybody is an English major, you know that it makes absolutely no sense since the word come is not uh, the name of somebody or a uh, proper noun. So I know that come is an adverb. I'm taking you somewhere, so bear with me. Come is an adverb, and come is a, an adverb that describes action. It means you can't stay where you are and see what I'm trying to show you. You've got to move from where you are, and you have got to come over here so that you can see what is going to happen next. Now, a comma typically follows an adverb, not come before an adverb. Now, here the word come is the same as quickly come, come quickly, hasten, denoting direction. It implies that don't stand there where you are. Hasten over here because what you are going to see is extremely important. And as I said, I looked at many versions of the Bible. I looked at about, I stopped after about 15. And they write it um, actually correct. They, they do write it in correct English. Um, and in the English language, they would have a small C 
at the word come, okay? King James is the only one that I found that has the capital C. Now in this case, come is a command. Come can stand by itself. It can be written with an exclamation point after it, come. Or it can be written with a period after it, come. Or it can be written with a common after it, connoting that something else is to come after that word. So here, it has no punctuation after it. The period stops after the word C. Now, this is not an error. The King James Bible did not make an error in writing this. But this, as I said, is a phrase that can stand by itself. You can pick come and see out of this phrase and just put it come and see. It's a sentence. It stands by itself. And so I'm still musing over, and this is musings on the book of Revelation. I am still musing over this. God and I had a conversation about this thing because I could not, from the perspective of a professor, from the perspective of someone who has spent all my life learning English and how to write it properly, this made no sense to my finite mind. And so I, I said uh, to the Lord, I said, I'm going to keep on reading and studying up on this one, God, because I got to really, 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 really for myself, understand why the angel said, come and see, and not just come. And why, after the comma, in the written King James Version, the come is capitalized. Now, <clears throat> In the first couple of verses of this chapter, four seals are open. Four. And they are open sequentially. And I'm going to show you how they're all collect connected as I go through them. And they all show a horse and then a rider. It doesn't say the rider and the horse. It says a horse and it gives us the color of the horse, and then it talks about the rider. So I decided in order to teach this the way I think God wants me to teach it anyway, is for me because it's important that the horse was described first to take a look at the horse in history and in scriptures. Why didn't he say, a rider and describe the rider. And then after he did that, say, um, was on a whatever color horse, okay? So I went to the turn of the century and I went to Ireland. And up to the turn of the century in Ireland, it was customary to have a procession. And if you have ever said in any of my teachings on Halloween, I talk about this. This was a man in a white robe wearing the head of a horse mask. And this particular horse wasn't just a horse. This horse was sacred to the sun god which indicated that this custom had survived the Druids, and this was a rite that they celebrated. The master of ceremonies uh, was called the white mare. And so these people would go from farmhouses to farmhouses, and this is how they celebrated All Hallows' Eve or Halloween. At the farmhouses, the people would recite a long string of verses. And then they would tell the farmers that if they made contributions to mock Allah, who was a pagan god, he 
would prosper them. If they did not make those contributions, he would curse them. They could lose their lives. And so this contribution that was levied from the farmers in the perverted name of was, which was probably an old Druid God went on for a very long period of time. Now, if the farmer did not have a gift for Mark Allah, if the farmers refused this procession, they were tricked, hence trick or treat. They were tricked with the threat of a curse that would ruin their crops for the upcoming year. The Celtic horse goddess was known under the names of Epona. Eco means horse. Another name was Maka. And the one that you find more in the internet is Rihanna, which sounds much like uh, Rihanna. You know the actress, Rihanna? Now, Rihanna was the protectress of the cavalry, chariot, and transport. Later on, she became the goddess of the Roman goldish legionaries, legionaries. She is represented either sitting on the side saddle of a horse, holding a magical small bird. And in your, uh, your video here, you can see her in the center. She either held a magical small bird or fruit, which is the symbol of fertility or she was seen standing between two horses. Another evidence of her worship is a rite going back to a remote time. And sitting around a big kettle, you had warriors who actually ate the bones and drank the blood of a horse. This was a sort of magic ritual to strengthen their sense of community. The veneration of the horse goddess becomes most obvious by the sacrifices made to her by the Druids. I know you wonder why I'm doing this and I'm supposed to be teaching Revelation. It's all gonna come together. It's important for all of us to realize that there's an organization today and you can, you can key it in on your internet. It's called the Druid Network. And it encapsulates the beliefs of their forefathers. Yes, this organization is alive, it is growing, and it is thriving. I'm not going to give you the name of the person who stated this, but you probably, if you go on their website, you'll see it. But this is what the person said. I'm doing this so that you can have a better understanding that this is what I'm saying, not the person. But I want you to have a better understanding that, oh, okay, Mother Motley, you're telling me that what is in Revelation is in the earth today. I'm telling you that the spirit of what is in this chapter is very alive. And yes, it is alive in the earth today. These people do not believe in the God that we serve. They believe in the ancient customs of the Druids. I'm telling you this so that you don't think, okay, why is she teaching about an ancient cult? I'm telling you this so that you can get a realistic picture of what is going on in the earth as we sit here tonight 
And we think that all this stuff is something that we're never going to have to experience, but you will see you are experiencing it. Some of us just don't know that it's going on. And I put it here in your slide. Would somebody please unmute if you don't mind and read what the Druid Network slide says. One brave soul, please unmute and read that. This is Denise. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord. It says, for me, the expression of deity and the gods as they are perceived within modern Druid, Druid, Druid are many and varied. Central to my understanding of Druidry, Druid, 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 if I'm not saying that right, is my, Druidry is my relationship with my gods. They are my greatest teachers, inspiring service and devotion to my craft. Simply, I understand the gods to be powers of nature, such as mud and rain, fire and love. They are the powers that touch our lives and affect the survival of humanity, provoking us into relationship with them and, and into awe at their inevitability and unstoppableness. They do not have personality and they do not care. The rain does not care for us, they simply are. Throughout time, humans have told stories of the gods, written mythologic mythologies, and given them names. I'm gonna botch this up. Uh, Sheridan and Ray. Rayana, Nun, Isis, and Sernumnos, personifying those powers of nature and enabling understanding and relationship. These are the ancient and ancestral gods caught within the consciousness of humanity, fed and strengthened by generations, teaching us the nature of deity and relationship with those forces of nature around us showing us how we might survive. Some of their names we have forgotten, their tales falling away as our relationship with nature changes, others walk with us still, continuing to touch our lives, telling the story of our humanity. Now you can find that, I put the source here, and I, I hope that you did write the source down because you need to go on that website. You need to see for yourself that what I'm saying is true. We have people today who are serving these gods. They still serve Rihanna, Isis. I know you all have heard of Isis. They're serving all of these Druid gods. And, and you see what he said here. He says that I understand the gods to be powers of nature, such as mud and rain, fire, or love. And then he talks about the rain doesn't care for us. They simply are. These gods do not have personality and they do not care. This is what he is saying. They still, and I will make my point later, they are still very strong in what they believe, in what they believe. Okay. Now, in scripture, we also see references made to horses in Deuteronomy 17 and 16. The horse is a beast of burden used for travel. The horse is also representative of the riches of the world. And I quote, but he shall not multiply horses for himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt to multiply horses. For the Lord has said to you, you shall not return that 
way again. Okay? Exodus 14 and 19. Write these scriptures down and study them in your own time at home. We see the horse being used to fight Egypt's battle against Israel. And I quote, so the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army, and overtook them camping by the sea besides Pi-Hahiroth before baal Zephon. Nehemiah 7, 68, illustrates the horse as a type of burden bearer for the Israelites. Their horses were 736, they, their mules 220. I won't go into the mules tonight because we're dealing with the horses. Esther 8 and 10 illustrates the horse as a message carrier. And he wrote the name of King Ahasuerus, sealed it with the king's signet ring, and sent letters by couriers on horseback, riding on royal horses, bred from swift stock. Last but not least, 2 Kings 23 and 11 illustrates the use of the horse in idol worship. Then he removed the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance to the house of the Lord by the chamber of Nathan Melak, the officer who was in the court, and he burned the chariots of the sun with fire. God threw down fire and burned these things up because the horse was used in idol worship by people who were supposed to be standing there to protect the house of God from that. Now, that's back then. Here's an article that I found that was written in 2020. Witchcraft panic grips France as police link horse mutilations to satanic cult rituals. A total of 30 horses were slain in this ritual. And you can find this. What you got to do is I put the link up there. Now, religious historian Jacques Cordonier, or Cordonier, this is uh, French, explain the thinking behind the mutilations. And I quote, we sacrifice the animals thinking the energy of the animal and its power will be transferred to us. They recover blood, the ear, the eye. It's a ritual of invocation of bewitchment. Now, listen to this. It is always the right ear because the left ear is Satan. A police spokesman in Paris said, we do not understand the motivation. Is it a satanic right? Insurance fraud? Some macabre trophy hunt? or an internet challenge, we don't know. It is very traumatizing. This just happened toward the latter part of 2020. Today, horses are burned in witchcraft rituals, the bones arranged in satanic symbols, their meat eaten, and their blood drank. This is the same thing that the Druids were doing back in how many centuries ago? It has not gone away. 
There is evidence of more than a dozen nighttime attacks on horses in Scotland, Wales, East Angolia, and Nottinghamshire. Investigators have found small stone cairns in the field where the attacks have taken place. The stones have been covered in burnt horse hair and candles. Black magic symbols, including pentagrams and double-headed axes have been discovered drawn or carved near by. Now, let's take a look at what is on your screen. In the macabre horse killings, ears have been sliced off, eyes removed, genitals cut, sides slashed, and blood drained. The strange mutilations where no meat is ever taken from the carcasses triggered a fear that the removed bodily parts were being used for ritual purposes. A small wooden sculpture believed to be a voodoo doll was found at the site of one of the attacks in August. Police are still open to other possibilities of motive, including a viral internet challenge, a group of horse haters, or even a series of copycat attacks. Now, I have given you rather lengthy discourse on horses in history because this has to be understood by each of us. I'm not saying horses are evil, but I am saying that throughout history, they have been used for evil purposes as well as for positiveness, depending on who the rider is. We have to understand the white horse before we can understand its rider. So we've talked about the horse. Now let's turn our attention to the rider. It says, he that sat on him had a bow and the crown. A crown was given unto him and he went forth conquering and to conquer. John opens chapter six with the words, and I saw, and I saw. This is powerful terminology because it's used 33 times throughout the book of Revelation. Chapter six is a continuation of the vision from chapter five, but, Chapter six introduces a new phenomenon. In chapter five, the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world receives the scroll and he breaks the first seal in chapter six. So he took it in five, five continues. Think about a, a series that you're looking at and you're following the series if you're looking at a movie that's broken up into parts, although this is not a movie. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us how much time lapsed, and I'm sure John doesn't know either, because John is looking across centuries, so he doesn't know how much time lapses, and we don't know how much time will lapse before each horse is released. We don't know how much time lapsed between chapters five and chapter six. But we do know that John is seeing a series of future events. It's up to us to be able to distinguish between the events that have historically occurred, those that are occurring, those that will ultimately take place in the future, and the spirit of what we are seeing. Now, before I began to teach on each of these four horses, I hasten to say that what is being seen are things that equate to events that will surely take place in the future, but the precursor to these things are on the earth now. Now, we know that everything that takes place in the earth 
is under the control of God who sits on his heavenly throne. And the four seals that are broken are written in a form, a syllogistic form of conclusion. In other words, what is a, syllog uh, a syllogism? A syllogism is a three-part logical argument. It's broken into three parts and it's based on deductive reasoning. And in that deductive reasoning, you have two premises or two points of view or two thoughts or whatever you wanna say. But these two are combined to come to one conclusion. So you have two thoughts, two premises, two assumptions that you combine and you arrive at a conclusion. Now, so long as the premises of the syllogism are true and it is correctly constructed, the conclusion has to be true. In other words, it's not the actual horses and riders that ride the earth, but it is their spirit that they represent. It is the spirits that are representative in the earth. We're not gonna literally see a horse with a rider, with a bow, with a crown, a white horse riding back and forth in the earth. But the spirit of that horse, praise God, is riding back and forth. While God allows evil to take place in the earth, God is not the author of evil and God is not the agent of evil. And if you study this book, you will be very clear on that point. So let us take a closer look at the rider. You know, this rider is the only rider that the head is described. In the other three, you will not see any attention given to the head. Now, many people, and some of you might not agree with my premise, but I'm gonna say it anyway, because I'm building the syllogism. Many people equate this horseman with Jesus Christ because it mentions a white horse. I just told you about Rhiannon who, wear, who, wore, who rode a white horse. I just told you about the Druid celebration of Mark Allah and a white horse was involved, okay? And a lot of times Christians believe that the white horse is Jesus because a white horse is mentioned in Revelation 11 and again in Revelation 19. And because it's written, they read it, but they're not understanding and they come to the conclusion that both riders or all three riders have to be Jesus Christ. Now, what I propose to, to do tonight is to take some of us out of our comfort zone because I'm going to compare and contrast the rider of the white horse in this particular passage of scripture to the rider of the white horse in Revelation 11. And as we study the white horse, its rider has a head, as I said, many suppose that Christ is the head because we know that we say Jesus Christ is the head of our lives, Christ is the head of the church, and so forth and so on. Typically, one would immediately suppose that the horseman on the white horse represents the kingdom of God because Jesus Christ is riding the white horse in Revelation 11. Why do I say this? Because typically the white horse symbolizes victory. The white horse also represents conquering the enemy through spiritual warfare. Okay. Let's go a little further. It's going to soon be time for me to stop. However, 
let us not jump to conclusions until we consider the spirit of the beast in Revelation 13 and 1. The beast certainly maintains the characteristics and description given to the rider of the white horse in the verse that we're studying here. Most people make a quantum leap because the first rider is on the white horse and is ready to conquer. But let's keep looking. They equate this with the Lord who rides a white horse in the Battle of Armageddon which takes place in Revelation 19, 11, and 21. I understand the confusion because one time I was confused, particularly when we're reading and reading and reading, and there are other people who are so much smarter than me who have come to the conclusion that this is Jesus Christ. But I studied and I prayed. And if I stand on this thing by myself, I stand on it by myself. This is not Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is breaking the seals. Jesus Christ is standing as the Lamb of God when this takes place. Jesus Christ has never been a man of war. Also, remember the events contained in the seals reveal what is going to take place on the earth after Jesus returns to take his people to heaven, aka as known as the rapture. And again, he will return to earth in Revelation 19. We will be in heaven when Revelation 19 take place. And I got news for you. We're already in heaven when all this stuff here is going on. Remember between chapters three and four, the rapture took place and we went through that. The white horse is a spiritual indication of the identity of the rider who comes conquering and to conquer. That's not what Jesus came to the earth to do. Jesus said, I come that you might have life and that more abundantly. Jesus said he came to set at liberty them which were lost. The Bible says, for whom the son made free is free indeed. So if all of that is Jesus, then why would Jesus come forth conquering and to conquer? This is an imitator. He comes to deceive many. He wants to conquer mankind. The spirit of the Antichrist comes to do those things. He's the spirit of the Antichrist walks the earth right as I am teaching you. He is here to deceive. He is here conquering and to conquer. Hell enlarges itself every day. He is the beast in the form of a man who rides a white horse. This is a part of his deception. And except the Lord open our understanding to this, we will go around thinking that he came to bring peace. Peace is the antithesis of conquering. How can you bring peace and conquer? As we continue to examine this figure, Let's look a little closer. We see that he has a bow, yes. In the scripture, a bow is the symbol of victory. Psalm 7 and 12 says, if he turn not, he will wet his sword. He hath bent his bow and made it ready. However, it also denotes falsehood in the scripture. who whet their tongue like a sword and bend their bows to shoot their arrows, even bitter words, that's Psalm 64 and three, that they may shoot in secret at the perfect, suddenly do they shoot at him and fear not, Psalms 64 and four. They return, but not to the most high, they are like a deceitful bow 
their princes shall fall by the sword for the rage of their tongue. This shall be their derision in the land of Egypt. Hosea 7 and 16. For they bend their tongue like their bow for lies, but they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth, for they proceed from evil to evil, and they know not me, saith the Lord. Jeremiah 9 and 3. So what if he has a bow? So what? We all know that the bow is indeed one of the first instruments of war. The bow also was used in spiritual warfare. Bows with arrows denote doctrine and its truth. Interestingly enough, the beast did not say this man had a bow and arrows. It simply said he had a bow. Now, we can make a quantum leap and assume that he had arrows because he has a bow, but I am not going to assume anything that was not mentioned in this scripture. My assumption is that he did not have arrows. He had a bow. Now you can say to me, uh, Dr. Motley, how can he conquer with no arrows and just a bow? And I, in turn, can say to you, that's it's for you to determine, not me. That is for God to know. But I can tell you that just as bowls signify the doctrine of truth, the mirror image is that if there is an absence of bowls, they can all they can uh signify the absence of them, signify the doctrine of falsehood. I can say that. Do I know if that's true? No. That's an assumption. I will go through it. I've been studying this book for years. I'll go through. There are things that I'm still going to continue to study. But I don't make the assumption that because he had a bow, he had a quiver that contained arrows. Now consider the crown. I want to try to get through this rider tonight because I got three more. Now consider the crown. Do you remember the throne room of God where there were 20 and four elders and they all had a crown and I taught you about the crowns, Stephanos, and I showed you pictures of two different crowns, the royal diadem and the Stephanos crown. The Stephanos crown was typically worn by people who had authority. They had the ability to rule. Yes, this writer has authority. And he has the ability to rule. But not you and I. He does not have the ability to rule us unless we backslide. Unless we walk away from the Lord. Because we won't be here. We will have been raptured. So he has the ability, God given the ability to go forth and back, conquering and to conquer. Jesus is not this rider. Jesus, there's a difference. Jesus has on a diadem. Now, both of these are nouns. Here we go back to the classroom. Both of these are nouns. And as nouns, there is a distinct difference in a diadem and a crown. A crown is typically a reward of victory or a mark of honor. A diadem is a, ro a royal headband. It is a badge of royalty. Jesus is royal. He represents royalty. He is in high priest after the order of Melchizedek. 
He's not wearing an ornamental headband. He is wearing a true diadem. This rider is a masquerade. He's trying to make us think that he is Jesus Christ. He has on a crown. He has on a Stephanos. He has on the type of crown that is given to people who are warriors. And that's why he goes back and forth conquering and to conquer. We cannot say that he is Jesus Christ. In Revelation 19 and 12, Jesus wore many crowns. I concur with Reverend James Smith, who was present uh, pres, um, predecessor to James Spurgeon at New Park Street Chapel in London from 1841 to 1850. Wise man. Because he let us know that Jesus passed through many trials, engaged in many conflicts, gained many triumphs, and now he wears many crowns. He wears the crown of victory. For every foe that will be overthrown by him. He wears the crown of sovereignty for he is king of kings and lord of lords. He wears the crown of creation for all things were made by him and for him and not anything was made that was not made by him. He wears the crown of providence for he sustains, supplies, and rules all that he has made. He wears the crown of grace, for he redeemed his people by his blood. <clears throat> he conquers the devil. He conquers everything by his spirit. He wears the crown of truth. He is king of kings and lord of lords he is not the rider on this first horse he wears the crown of glory for every one of us whom he has glorified we owe him our honor like the 20 and 4 elders in Revelation 5 who fell down and cast their crowns before him and said, worthy, holy is the lamb which was slain before the foundation of the earth. He is crowned by his father with a splendid diadem. Hey, God. Hey, God. And every knee must bow to him. We all crown him. Every one of us who are his people. We all cast our crowns at his feet and say, Lord, make us worthy to wear them in your presence. His crown is the brightest that ever wisdom devised, mercy jeweled, or power brightened. Oh, to gaze upon his glory and to see on his once thorn-pierced brows the many <laughs> brows that he wears. So you see, the Antichrist will also wear a crown. But he will never wear a diadem. This shows to me that he is not the true Messiah who wears the crown of royalty. Oh, he will have some victory. So he does have on a crown of victory because he is going to conquer and he is going to go forth in the earth to conquer but oh Lord, thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you, God. He is not my savior. He has a mouth to speak great things and blasphemies and power will be given to him to continue 40 and two months. And he will open his mouth to blaspheme God. He will curse and rage against all who live in heaven. And he will make war, is making war right now with us, trying to conquer us. Trying to conquer us. That spirit is here right now, trying to conquer us, trying to conquer our will, trying to conquer our faith in God, trying to conquer our prayer, trying to conquer, hallelujah, our service to the Lord God Almighty. And some he will conquer. Because those whose names are not written in the book of life will worship him. They will be deceived by him for a while. Thank God. The Bible says he will fool the very elect if it were possible. Thank God it's not possible for him to fool us. In the Greek translation, the crown worn by the rider of the white horse refers to the crown of victory worn by one who conquers. The crowns that Jesus wears in Revelation 9, 19 refer to crowns of royalty and victory. It is one thing to be conquered. It is another thing to have the victory. This is the end of, well, no, it's not the end. I got a couple more slides. We now turn our attention to the conduct of the rider. I didn't talk about the rider. The rider's sole purpose was to conquer. The Bible says conquering and to conquer. Who is he out to conquer? Is it our enemies or is it us? Are our enemies in his army? We're certainly not in his army. His primary objective is to violently rule over others through conquest. As we continue in our study of this book, we will see that these are descriptive details related to the beast. The Lord Jesus predicted that the end of age would begin with a dramatic increase in false doctrine. These false doctrines will embody one message, but this message will have evil and false objectives as indicated in Matthew 24 and 5. Matthew said, for many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. In other words, he does not have the spirit of Jesus Christ, but could very well have the spirit of the Antichrist. This imposter could come into the church, go through the process of being saved just to get to us. He might stay in the church for six months to a year. And one day he'll take a sister out of the church. This is the spirit that's in the land now. He'll take a sister out of the church and she'll think that he loves her so much until she wakes up to find out that she's been sleeping with the enemy. Because this man has come. The spirit of the Antichrist is in him. And he's going to conquer her will to worship. Her will to pray. Her will to seek those things that are from above. Her will to live a sin-free life. Her will to live holy when you see her and when you don't. He will conquer her will to be a good mother, her will to be a good wife, her will to be a good child of God. He will conquer her will to keep herself chaste. He will conquer her will. He will conquer her will. He will conquer her will. 
he will conquer her will to the point that she'll start to call wrong, right, and right, wrong. The Bible says that he will fool the very elect, if it were possible, as I said earlier. He will appear to be the very perfect deacon, the, 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 the perfect minister. He will have people eating out of his hand. And he will use that same hand to beat, to maim, to kill, to destroy. So I say to you, my sisters and brothers, do not, by any means necessary, in the words of Malcolm X, do not, by any means necessary, follow after this man. Follow after anybody that's got the spirit, because as I said before I started teaching, we're seeing future things, but the spirit of everything I am teaching is in the earth. It's not somewhere waiting to come. That spirit is here. The Bible says that the devil goes back and forth as a roaring lion seeking whom he may destroy or conquer. Don't be fooled. Do not be fooled. This demon spirit is already in the earth. Thank God we will be raptured when the fullness of this is unleashed in the earth. Don't be fooled. We are the elect of God. Act like it. We don't have time to play church. A lot of people, I know you, you got things to do. You come and go and you come and go and you don't stay long enough to get the fullness of what we are trying to teach in this. But I am given a charge by God to teach this. It is a mission that God has put in my heart because he has a number of people who he does not want to be fooled by this demon. Hallelujah. We have got to get in the word and stay there. We have got to understand what God is wanting us to, to, to do. We cannot afford to be deceived because if we are deceived, this demon will take us straight to hell. He will conquer us. He will separate us from God's truth. He cares nothing for any of us. And if he can put it in our minds not to listen to this teaching, trust me, that's what he wants. That's what he wants. He will put everything in our way to keep us so busy, so preoccupied that we don't want to turn in and hear what thus saith the Lord. But I am here tonight. I stand on what God has told me to do. I stand on the word of God. I don't care what people think about me. I have been given a commission to teach revelation and teach it. I will to the glory of God. 